Well, howdy, 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 everyone, and welcome back to The Rancher Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Halverson. Uh, We are going back today to another edition of the Legendary Rancher series where I talk about the men and women who had a lasting impact on the ranching history of America. I know my last episode was uh, the Western Sports Wednesday, and before we did that, there was an interview with the historian Gail Warner, but uh, we're back to Legendary Ranchers today, and... If you have any historical figures, any ranchers that you would like me to cover in this, again, as I always say, please feel free to send me an email or a DM on Instagram or Facebook, and I would be happy to take those into consideration. However, today we are covering undoubtedly the most famous rancher of all time. I know I said that about Charles Goodnight, but I was wrong. This man has to be the most famous rancher of all time, and I'll tell you why. He did not become popular for his ranching, and in fact, he actually didn't do ranching for very long. But he has to be the most famous one because this man is Teddy Roosevelt. The future president of the United States was once a rancher. In his mid-20s, the truly heartbroken Teddy Roosevelt set out for Dakota Territory to make a go at ranching. His entire world in New York City had just shattered around him, And he was in dire need of a place to escape to. And he found it in the beautiful Badlands that proved to be just the type of place he needed. And what ensued there were months and months of valuable experience that helped rebuild the man who would become one of the most consequential presidents in the United States history. We're going to get into the whole story right after a quick word from our sponsors. Well, I'm proud to welcome the newest sponsor for the Rancher Podcast, and that is Elite Ranch Consulting. They are your one-stop shop for protecting your real estate investment. Whether you inherited a piece of land, bought a ranch as your vacation home, or are simply looking to maximize the land you are already working, Elite Ranch Consulting's team of experts can help you make the right decisions to make your land profitable. Visit EliteRanchConsulting.com today to learn more about how they can protect your American dream. A large X marked the top two lines of Teddy Roosevelt's diary on Valentine's Day, 1884. That X was followed by one single, honestly, heart-wrenching sentence. It said, the light has gone out of my life. Four years earlier on Valentine's Day, the vivacious young Roosevelt had announced his engagement to Alice Hathaway Lee, of whom he said no man had ever loved a woman before as he loved her. But now, he found himself having to announce her death just four years later, along with the death of his beloved Mitty just a few hours later. How he was even able to write that single sentence, I I don't know, I cannot even fathom. Because he found himself without a mother, without a wife, and holding a few day old baby daughter who would grow up without the influence of either of them. And I just think that the pain had to have been absolutely crippling for the young father. For the coming months, he tried to immerse himself in his legislative work and on the tumultuous presidential election of 1884, but his frustration with the current political landscape and his home life in shambles, he was led to move out to Dakota Territory on his newly bought ranch on the Little Missouri River. You see, Roosevelt is a fascinating character in the pantheon of American heroes for many reasons. He lived so many lives, and much of what is taught in history classes about him really just captures a mere snapshot of his presidency and some of his military service. Um, And the question I always ask is why? But the truth is, Roosevelt did so much during his life and during his presidency that to teach it all would likely take a semester in itself. He railed against corruption in the New York State Assembly, worked to modernize the Navy, he led troops in Cuba, 
explored South American rivers, and led this nation with an iron fist that made us a global or set us up to be a global superpower. He also, though, spent a few years as a cattle rancher. These years, honestly, very inconsequential from the perspective of what else he did in his life, were actually really crucial to the molding of this man who, as I've described, was in absolute shambles. His life had fallen around him and he needed somewhere to go to find himself and to find the true American West. So he headed out to learn more about the country and its people and, like I said, to learn more about himself. He came to Dakota Territory a New York tenderfoot who likely never knew the price of a gallon of milk and he left a man of the people that was so ingratiated with them that when he ran for president, they dubbed him the cowboy president. There are going to be a few episodes on this time in Roosevelt's life, so this is just part one. I look forward to going in depth and providing information not just on Teddy Roosevelt, but on the cattle industry as a whole at this time through the perspective of those in Dakota Territory. So, who was Teddy Roosevelt exactly? He was born into one of New York's elite Dutch families, the Roosevelts, who were members of the Knickerbocker class that includes names such as Rockefeller, Astor, and Vanderbilt. While his father, Teddy Sr., was a New Yorker through and through, his mother, Mitty Bullock Roosevelt, was actually raised in Georgia and had all the sensibilities of a Southern belle. In fact, you know, one of my favorite stories about Mitty that I like to th uh, talk about is that uh, you can learn about this in the Ken Burns documentary about the Roosevelt family. But when the Civil War broke out, she flew a Confederate flag outside of their New York City townhome. And I just, I mean, that takes incredible bravery, gumption, whatever, to, you know, willingly wave the flag of an enemy nation in, you know, Union territory. I, I just think that this is likely the source of uh, Teddy's similar tendency to pursue these more daunting challenges of life and not really care what other people think, but do what they want. Uh, so, you know, he had a very wealthy patrician father and a well-respected Southern mother. And I just, you know, I, I find that story about his mother great, but uh, Teddy was actually a sickly child. Uh, and he determined that he was not going to let his sickness, his ailments define him. So he forced himself to exercise to the point of exhaustion daily. He would do these breathing exercises to strengthen his lungs because he had asthma. He walked and hiked daily along with a rigorous calisthenic routine that he did in the parks of New York. Uh, and he included uh, using his large encyclopedias and other books as weights in that uh, exercise regimen but you know I think it's interesting to learn that about his childhood because it really runs contrary to the image we have uh, today of Teddy Roosevelt in his older years when he was president because at that time he looked like a stout barrel chested brawler who never turned down a fight either philosophically or physically but indeed, you know, Roosevelt willed himself into that man from the sick little boy that he started as. Uh, actually, you know, Roosevelt would quickly tell folks when he got out west that a doctor once told him that he should never do anything more strenuous than walk up a flight of stairs. Of course, he never followed that advice, and instead, there are stories that he said he, he left that doctor's office and immediately started running stairs. So... You know, he's he's kind of like the, if you know David Goggins, the inspirational speecher, he's kind of the David Goggins of his era. Somebody told him you can't do that. He immediately goes out and does it and makes sure that he, uh, you know, overcomes anything in his life. Um, he was also a vociferous reader. So those books that he was using as weights, he was also reading them. And honestly, he grew up to be the epitome of a New York dandy. And, uh, you know, Dandies, I always say just how we can identify members of uh, fraternities by the pastel shades they wear and the inseam of their shorts. 
the dandies of the late 1800s were easily distinguishable as members of the higher class, the patrician class, because they wore these beautiful, colorful suits with all the accoutrement. You know, they always had to have a fresh flower in their lapel. They had to have the beautiful chain of their pocket watch hanging out. Um, you know, great facial hair, all these things. And Teddy Roosevelt, you know, was one of those men. He uh, dressed the part, acted the part, and was wholly part of that Knickerbocker class. So, of course, when he got to Dakota Territory in 1883 to hunt, he did not show up in his dandy wear, but he showed up every bit the dandy with a western flair. He had custom buckskin outfit made that was complete with beads and fringe along with a coonskin cap. And you can find photos of this online. There's actually quite a few of staged photos that he did, uh, I guess, before or after he took off for Dakota. But another interesting thing, his bowie knife was made of silver by the good folks over at uh, Tiffany & Co. And he carried a matching pair of gold and silver six shooters with ivory handles. I mean, can you even imagine, this is like showing up to some rural small town in a brand new, you know, Mercedes G wagon, hopping out in a pair of brand new crisp selvage jeans, uh, you know, $2,500, $3,000 uh, alligator boots, and, you know, a thousand X hat. I mean, he was playing the part and he did it with style and panache. And, you know, between that and the spectacles that he wore, he stuck out like a sore thumb in the West. They said that men that wore buckskins like that were immediately picked out as tenderfoots at the time. Uh, but, you know, I don't think it really bothered him. But back to his earlier life, you know, uh, Roosevelt was a dandy, of course, but he attended Harvard University and became a member of the prestigious Porcellian Supper Club. But at the same time, he also took up boxing. And again, there's another great photo of a young Teddy Roosevelt online. It was during his time at Harvard, where he's sitting shirtless in, the ch in a chair, showing a mean mug that's bordered by some great, fashionable lamb chops that flare out from his cheeks. And, you know, he looks quite different than the man that we remember, the one that has his face carved into Mount Rushmore, because he doesn't have the distinctive glasses and he doesn't have the distinctive mustache. Um... It's a, it's a great testament to the fact that he kept himself physically fit so that he could fight with the best of them, and he kept his mind acute so that he could also argue with the best of them. But, you know, on 1880, on his 22nd birthday, he married Alice Hathaway Lee of Massachusetts in the Boston suburb of Brookline, which I just want to take a moment to say, Brookline is also where the Kennedy family called home for many years. Uh, this is a very prestigious suburb of Boston, a beautiful suburb of Boston, and at that time, it was the height of society. So, of course, this young Harvard man from New York finds himself falling in love with a Massachusetts girl from Brookline. And he absolutely adored the blonde-haired and blue-eyed Brahmin, who was three years his junior. And shortly after the wedding, they moved back to New York, where he began studying law at Columbia. And, you know... He was becoming the tough and, you know, just youthful young man that loved exercise his mind and his body. And during this time in American history, men like that had this idea of the noblesse oblige or the noblesse oblige. And it was a, this popular idea that if you've ever seen Downton Abbey, uh, the fact that men like uh, the uh, Duke and... Uh, you know, men of that class, the, the reason that they fought in World War I was this idea that they should be, um, you know, providing service to the folks on the front lines and the folks of their country because they had the time. They were not busy working full-time jobs. And, you know, Roosevelt was of that, uh, you know, social class. So um, he decided to run for the New York State Assembly while he was at uh, Columbia, and he eventually won and promptly dro dropped out of law school. In fact, he had a quote uh, where he said that at that time he knew that he was a man of the government, not of the law, which, I mean, for some of us might sound interesting, 
Of course, you know, you think that the, the government has a lot to do with law, but there are men that, um, you know, are very successful in politics and in governance that never uh, studied the law. So there's d certainly a difference there, and he chose the more political path. And, you know, he was a firebrand reformer in the assembly. Um, you know, he, he was really somebody that was polarizing. He quickly gained friends and enemies alike with his passion for rooting out the corruption and greed from the likes of the political bosses that ran the political machines like Tammany Hall. I mean, I know that's the most famous one. It plays uh, a great part in the, the movie Gangs of New York. And, you know, that was one of the things that, like a lot of politicians we hear from today, they always say that they're, these wealthier politicians always say, well, I, you know, I'm a businessman. I won't be corrupted by the system. Uh, and, you know, Roosevelt was kind of a, a prototype for that type of politician. But outside of politics, he actually led uh, a typical New York elite life. You know, he attended the social gatherings and his father actually helped found many of the museums in the city, including the, uh, the Metropolitan Museum. And Roosevelt was always drawn to uh, attending these events, but also the more outdoors pursuits, such as horseback riding and hunting. So, of course, being the ever the 19th century sportsman, Roosevelt wanted to go out west to hunt the now more and more elusive buffalo and, of course, pronghorn. So, he showed up in the Badlands in uh, the year 1883. And, you know, the, the Dakota Badlands, they rise and fall like a decades-old highway giving way to stark walls on, of earth on what is, you know, otherwise a flat plain of the American West. I was listening to a description of New Mexico and Arizona's deserts the other day, and they described the, the features, the coolies, you know, the canyons, the rock formations as relief from the the ever pushing plains you know the ever expanding uh, ocean of land that are the plains and the badlands are very similar to that you know these changes in elevations plus the moisture levels and soil content lead to confusingly honestly confusingly lush prairies that played home to the legendary game animals of america and you know it gave them a great place to hide. There were so many ravines um, and there was so much lush grass for them to consume along the river banks of rivers such as the Little Missouri, uh, the Platte River. And, uh, you know, it almost felt like in some of these areas a natural secret garden with its protective walls and miles and miles of plains and desert essentially around it. Um, just a truly beautiful area. If you've never been to the Badlands, then I would definitely recommend it. And, you know, he was greeted with these wonders upon his arrival in the territory, but he was not greeted with the hordes of bison that had once roamed the plains. In fact, there's somebody in um, the book that uh, I read that kind of inspired this podcast called Roosevelt in the Badlands, who said that Teddy showed up really right at a, a, a turning point or a crucial point in the buffalo hunting. And they said that, you know, people were killing them by the thousands in 1882 and 83. And by 1884, they were gone. And, you know, that was actually part of the reason that Roosevelt wanted to go on this hunt because he wanted to shoot a bison before there weren't any left. And I, I find this so interesting because we remember Teddy Roosevelt as uh, the great conservative in the sense that he helped design and create the national park system, something that nowhere else in the world had. He created it, and we believe him to be this great conservationist, but you know, he really was a product of his time for quite a while, and this is great evidence of that. Um, you know, he was there to essentially help something go extinct, but he wanted to be a part of it before it was gone. Uh, so, you know, he, he didn't really find very many willing uh, folks to help him with this because, again, he looked like a tenderfoot. And uh, he had actually planned to travel west with a friend, 
but they had actually backed out at the last second. So he was alone in unknown territory without a guide. And, you know, interestingly, his solution was he went to a saloon in the town of Little Missouri, which was on the Little Missouri River, and he eventually found somebody after asking all around. He found a local rancher named Joe Ferris, who agreed to be his guide. So Ferris initially didn't really trust Roosevelt, and uh, he planned to have him actually ride in the back of a wagon because he didn't trust him to ride any of his horses, but Teddy insisted that he ride horseback. And, you know, Ferris was quoted as saying he was apprehensive because he didn't want a stranger to take his horse for fear that he might run off with it. You know, that was a serious concern, especially when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you don't want to be robbed and uh, your horse stolen. And, you know, if you're too far away from civilization, that's a, a death sentence. So Roosevelt, to assuage his fears, just flat out bought the buckskin named Nell for $50. And that convinced Ferris that this Roosevelt fellow was all right. And so they headed off horseback into the plains. Well, what ensued on that day's long hunt was that Murphy's Law was followed to a T. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. They were rained on. They failed to find much water that was drinkable. They almost lost a horse in quicksand. And in the middle of the night, wolves ran their horses more than a mile off and they had to go find them. I mean, this was a terrible trip. At one point, Roosevelt is crawling across the ground and fills his hands with the spikes of a cactus. I mean, just nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. But honestly, I think that's exactly what Teddy Roosevelt wanted. He wanted the true Western experience. And on top of that, you know, on top of all of his troubles, he was not a great shot. And that might have been a fact that the guns were... Um, not as accurate back then but also you know he wore those glasses for a reason and he turned out to miss quite a few animals only wound a few animals and it was just i mean it had to have been uh, a terrible trip for joe ferris who was wondering the whole time what have i gotten myself into taking this guy out here i mean teddy was essentially proving the tenderfoot stereotype when it came to the hunt obviously he was being a, a tough buckaroo if you will uh, helping out crawling along the ground getting the horse out of the quicksand but man i mean it had to have been quite tough to to watch this man miss shot after shot after shot but you know they finally had success and the more important than the acquisition of the buffalo head for his wall was actually the friendships that uh Roosevelt made not only with Joe Ferris, but with some other folks in the American West. So he was finally successful. He got himself a big bull that um, he shot on a ridgeline and watched it fall down onto the other side. And he was so excited. You know, one of the funny things about Roosevelt is that uh, in the book, Roosevelt and the Badlands, they describe how every time he would shoot uh wild game there were two things that he would do first of all he would immediately go into a imitation of a uh indian war dance he would you know start jumping around uh with just absolute glee that he had shot this animal and the second thing he would do is lavish his guide with a a, a gift and uh in this case on this hunt he immediately gave him uh, $100 bill, which, you know, again, he paid $50 for the horse. So he was giving him double that just for sh uh, helping him shoot this animal. So I, I think that's a pretty interesting insight into Teddy Roosevelt and 
one thing that we're probably going to talk a lot more about is that uh, in typical wealthy, uh, you know, playboy style, he didn't really have much of a concept for money and spent it quite freely. And, you know, it was through the conversations with Ferris that Roosevelt decided that he wanted in on the cattle business. He gave Ferris and another fellow named Maryfield a check for $14,000. I mean, you know, $14,000 today is somewhere close to $600,000 to a million dollars, depending on, you know, uh, what, what you consider the exchange rate, you know, because we've transferred to the, the gold and silver standard to, uh, you know, debased currency. But that, that's a lot of money at this time. He had never met these men before. And, you know, they were like, do you need a receipt? Do you need a contract written up? And all he said was, no, I trust you men. You've helped me with my hunt here. And all I need is for word from you whenever you get to Minneapolis, Minnesota to buy the cattle that were, were good. So, uh, you know, quite literally a smile and a handshake were the only deal he had with these men before he turned over $14,000 to them. So he headed back to New York City, a bona fide cowman. And, you know, that's where we're going where we're gonna to end today's episode. Uh, the next episode, we'll get into exactly what happened when he got back to, um, you know, the, the Dakota Territory. It turns out he was not the only big fish in that little pond. Um, and, you know, a lot of interesting stuff is going to ensue during this short amount of time that Teddy Roosevelt is in the Badlands. So thank you guys for tuning in to today's episode. I can't wait to continue to talk about uh, Teddy and his time as a cattle rancher. I also have some interviews that I've been doing, so look for those podcasts in the next few days. And of course, please follow me on Instagram um, and Facebook. And of course, you can always email me. And if you like the show, please review it on iTunes Podcasts. But until next time, Godspeed and God bless.